Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing, hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. All right, in today's episode, we'll be talking about packed red blood cells or red blood cell transfusion. This is going to be a kind of introductory or basic um, episode on packed red blood cells, good for kind of introductory foundational topics. Uh, in the future, we'll probably come out with some more advanced topics related to blood transfusion, but this will be the introductory basics. We'll do an introduction. We'll talk about what PRBCs or packed red blood cells are in indications for pectoral blood cell transfusion, expected effects, dosing, administration guidelines, risk complications, and special considerations. For those of you listening to this as a podcast, just know that our YouTube video is linked in the description. For those of you watching this as a YouTube video, the podcast link is in the video description as well. We also have a Patreon page where we will post the study guide for this lecture as well as practice questions. And we do have a weekly free newsletter. All that's linked in the description for the episode. No further ado, introduction, packed red blood cell are a blood product used to treat anemia, which is low hemoglobin, and improve oxygen carrying capacity. What that essentially means is we have blood vessels. Those blood vessels are full of red blood cells. And those red blood cells have hemoglobin molecules, and those hemoglobin molecules carry oxygen. So the red blood cells by way of the hemoglobin molecules carry and deliver oxygen to tissues. So by transfusing more red blood cells in packed red blood cells, right, by transfusing PRBCs, you're increasing the number of red blood cells that a person has, which will increase the amount of oxygen that person can deliver to their tissues. They're the most commonly transfused components, blood components in clinical practice, packed red blood cells are. So very common um, in our clinical practice, we uh, transfuse PRBCs, if not every shift, you know, maybe every other we work in the intensive care unit in the emergency department. So it's a very common thing that occurs. What are PRBCs? And for the sake of thoroughness, we're using PRBC uh, as the abbreviation. This stands for packed red blood cells. But this is, you know, it is a formal thing that we say in the clinical arena, but it, it's somewhat kind of quote-unquote slang too. Uh, we're just talking about red blood cell transfusion when we say PRBC. So definition, what are PRBCs? So PRBCs are red blood cells that have been separated from whole blood, um, typically stored in additive solutions. So these are, you know, quote unquote, purified red blood cells harvested from whole blood stored in additive solutions. The key features related to PRBCs is that one unit of packed red blood cells of PRBCs, a single unit, which is the kind of uh, volume measurements you use to order PRBCs. You can order one unit, two units, three units, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of the volume of a single unit of PRBCs is about 300 milliliters per unit. That's a rough estimate, okay? About 300 milliliters per unit. So when you're transfusing one unit of PRBCs, you're giving that patient about 300 cc's of volume. Remember, these are PRBCs, right? So most of that volume stays in the intravascular space. Not much of it leaks into the extravascular space. We've talked about that in the channel in the past in terms of fluid compartments, extracellular, intracellular, within the extracellular, intravascular, and extravascular. So most PRBCs, the volume stays in the intravascular space. Um, the hematocrit of unit of PRBCs is about 60 to 70 percent, if that is a fact that's interesting to people. And we store packed red blood cells at about one to six degrees Celsius, and you can store them for up to 42 days. So these don't stay good forever. This is why blood shortages are a really big deal. Um, well, one of the many reasons. We also need more people to donate blood and all that kind of stuff, but they don't last forever. Um, now, it does depend on the additive solution they're stored in. Um, and then there's no functional platelets or clotting factors in PRBCs, right? These are red blood cells, okay? You're not transfusing PRBCs to give platelets. You're not transfusing PRBCs to give clotting factors or fibrinogen or any of that kind of stuff. We're going to be coming out with videos on fresh frozen plasma and cryoprecipitate and some of that other stuff. Um, but yeah, no functional platelets or clotting factors in a unit of PRBCs. These are purified red blood cells. All right, indications for PRBC transfusion. Well, the primary indications that most people talk about are number one, symptomatic anemia. What does this mean? This means that your hemoglobin or hematocrit, hemoglobin HGB, 
dropped, right? You're bleeding, you're having blood loss, and this is causing symptoms of low hemoglobin, which essentially are symptoms that you do not have enough ability to deliver oxygen to your tissues. These can be things like chest pain, lightheadedness, dizziness, shortness of breath, um, fatigue, generalized weakness, all those types of things. Anything that suggests that you're not delivering enough oxygen to your tissues. So decreased O2 delivering capacity is what drives symptoms of symptomatic anemia. Acute blood loss or hemorrhage is another indication, right? If you're losing blood and it's causing you to have symptomatic anemia, you certainly should transfuse blood back. Um, when you are bleeding, the treatment for bleeding is to transfuse blood. It's not to give IV fluids, it's to transfuse blood. Uh, a number that we tend to use as well when it comes to transfusions is a hemoglobin of less than seven. The units on that is grams per deciliter. And that number is in the literature. It's what has been studied. Um, but it, it's not necessarily a slam dunk, right? If you have chronic anemia, all right, you live out in the world and your baseline hemoglobin, your normal hemoglobin is 7.2, and then your hemoglobin drops to 6.9, you probably aren't going to even notice this, but many of us would transfuse you with a hemoglobin of 6.9 because it's less than 7. And that's what we have in terms of, uh, you know, recommendations and literature and things like that, but it probably would be fine with a hemoglobin of 6.9 or as fine as you would with a hemoglobin of 6.9 compared to 7.2, okay? But yeah, hemoglobin less than 7 in stable patients is often uh, used as a transfusion threshold to then transfuse a unit of PRBCs. In cardiac patients or perioperative patients, uh, a lot of people talk about a hemoglobin less than 8 grams per deciliter as a cutoff to transfuse. There is some evidence in our patients with cardiac dysfunction to target a hemoglobin of eight. Um, but again, there's some variability in the practice patterns here. Another indication, which is something that um, isn't super common, but um, certain specialists such as hematologists uh, see this, but sickle cell crisis or severe hypoxia. Severe hypoxia is something we kind of take a little bit of uh, a problem with, uh, we would cross this off. You know, the treatment of severe hypoxia is not necessarily blood transfusion, um, but it is something that people sometimes do. But yeah, sickle cell crisis. The caveat and why there's all these kind of hesitancies on our part is that you always have to consider symptoms and critical context, not just lab values, okay? Some people who live in the world with a normal hemoglobin of 13, if their hemoglobin's nine, they're probably feeling pretty crummy and they probably would benefit from transfusion, whether you should or not, depends on symptoms, clinical context, are they symptomatic, are they actively bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas again, someone with chronic anemia with a baseline hemoglobin of 7.2, they're probably fine with a hemoglobin of 6.9. That's probably not changing too much for them. So all about symptoms and clinical context, not just lab values. All right, expected effects and dosing. When you transfuse one unit of packed red blood cells, that will typically increase the hemoglobin by one gram per deciliter. So if your hemoglobin to start is 6.5, you give that person one unit of PRBCs. If they respond appropriately, and we'll say that in the clinical arena a lot, did it respond appropriately, right? Did their hemoglobin increase, as you would imagine? Their hemoglobin should increase to 7.5. It should go up by one gram per deciliter. Now, again, not a perfect science. If they're actively bleeding, it might not respond appropriately. But, you know, if it's 7.2 or 7.7, .7, all these have a measure of error. Um, but yes, one unit of PRBC should increase the hemoglobin by about one gram per deciliter. Hematocrit, if you prefer to use that, about 3%. Um, but yes, in the clinical arena, we'll ask if their hemoglobin responded appropriately. And that uh, phrase is essentially asking, did it go up by about one gram per deciliter? Because if it didn't, it could imply that they're still actively bleeding or maybe they're hemolyzing their hemoglobin or something else happened. Typically, when we dose PRBCs, we give as single units. Um, if someone is just having mild symptomatic anemia or their hemoglobin is a little less than seven, we'll typically just order one unit of PRBCs. If someone is really, really sick, you can order more than one unit at a time. There's also things called massive transfusion protocol or MTP, which is usually a cooler that's brought up that has PRBCs and platelets and FFP and sometimes calcium. It even instead sometimes has whole blood instead of all these different components. Um, but yes, we typically order blood transfusion as single units, uh, and then we reassess, get a repeat CBC. Did it respond as anticipated? Um, larger doses and trauma and active hemorrhage gets into that MTP discussion a little bit.
Maybe we'll do a video on MTP. That might be uh, interesting. Let us know what you think. Administration guidelines. Uh, this is outside a little bit of our scope, um, but uh, what we tend to see out there is that you should transfuse within 30 minutes of removal from refrigeration. So you can't just have a unit of PRBC sitting on the on the uh, on the unit. Well, I guess that's too many units. You can't have a unit of PRBC sitting on the floor uh, or in a patient's room, just hanging out in case they need it. These should be given within 30 minutes. We've heard variability in here, so don't take this as a hard and fast rule. Talk to your blood bank. Um, on what their recommendations are. Uh, complete transfusion within four hours, again, related to kind of refrigeration, but talk to your blood bank. Uh, it is compatible, PRBCs are compatible with normal saline. Now, if you've been watching all of our videos on the channel, we've had a lot of videos out on IV fluids. We've talked about normal saline, lactated ringers, plasma light. Um, do we ever talk about normal sol? Can't remember, we've compared all of these different fluids. And this is getting at the fact that normal saline does not have calcium, whereas lactated ringers LR does have calcium, which makes it incompatible with PRBCs. Um, so lactated ringers has calcium, which is why it cannot be given with PRBCs, where normal saline does not have calcium, so it can be given with PRBCs. You should administer with uh, blood tubing, and then you should always monitor vitals before, during, or after, because transition into the next part of the video, risks and complications, transfusion reactions. That's why you're monitoring vitals so frequently. There's a number of transfusion reactions that can happen, and we probably will put out videos on each one of these at some point in the coming time. <laughs> um, but yeah, febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. This is where you literally get a fever from the blood, but you're not hemolyzing because this is in comparison to a hemolytic transfusion reaction, which can be really, really serious, which is where you're literally lysing, you're hemolyzing, uh, you're destroying the blood cells being given to you. Um, and this can be really serious. So you got to monitor for this. You can certainly get an allergic reaction, just like you can from anything, rash, urticaria, um, swelling, itchiness, GI upset, all that. Uh, you can also get these two different transfusion re related reactions called trolley and taco. Trolley stands for transfusion related acute lung injury and taco stands for transfusion associated circulatory overload. Um, so taco transfusion associated circulatory overload is just essentially too much volume. You know, someone has heart failure and ESRD and you give them a bunch of packed red blood cells, it just might be too much volume and they'll get circulatory overload. Trolley is an actual inflammatory injury to the lungs related to blood transfusion. Uh, and you often will get kind of patchy uh, infiltrates on chest x-ray, shortness of breath, maybe increased respiratory rate, hypoxemia, low oxygen levels. Um, so that can be really serious. Not common, but it can happen. And then people with, you know, sickle cell disease or other conditions that lead to a requirement for repeated transfusions can get iron overload. Um, this is not common, and this isn't going to be someone who just gets transfusions every now and again. This has to be someone who gets really frequent transfusions. Special considerations when it comes to packed red blood cells. Uh, you obviously want to type and cross match before transfusion. You have to make sure that that blood is a match for the patient, which essentially is A, B, A, B, O, so their blood type, right? And you have to look at antibodies uh, depending on gender. You have to look at RH positive, negative. Um, so there's a lot of kind of matching that has to occur. All right. And then in a different video, we actually talked about leukoreduction, irradiation, washing, and we keep forgetting we have a podcast in a different video or podcast because uh, the episode's out on both. So look that up too. We will link it in the hematology playlist as well um, because there are some kind of special circumstances where you have to leukoreduce, which gets rid of white blood cells that might be there or irradiate, which is literally giving the packed red blood cells a little bit of radiation where you can wash those red blood cells to try to get rid of uh, any ancillary product in there. So summary to our packed red blood cell video. Volume per unit, about 300 cc's or milliliters per one unit of PRBCs, okay? The hematocrit of a single unit is about 60 to 70 percent. Store PRBC is about 1 to 6 degrees Celsius. Shelf life is about 42 days. It should increase your hemoglobin by about 1 gram per deciliter per unit. Compatible with normal saline, not compatible with LR. All right, transfusion time within four hours. Uh, you many times kind of run the blood slow so that you 
uh, decreased risk of transfusion reactions, although if someone is really sick, you can run it faster. Uh, and then monitor them to make sure they don't have a transfusion reaction, whether that is a febrile transfusion reaction, TACO, which is transfusion associated circulatory overload, trolley, which is transfusion associated lung injury, uh, hemolytic transfusion reaction, right? You're monitoring for all these things uh, with vital signs pre, during, and post. So that was our introduction to packed red blood cell transfusion. Let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you might have. If you're listening to the podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe. Give us five stars. If you're watching the video, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell button. Uh, again, check out our Patreon page for study guide and practice questions. And then if you're interested, we have that free weekly newsletter that comes out on public health and uh, medical education topics over the last week. Awesome. Well, in any case, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you all next time.